All right, good morning, everybody. It's been a rainy morning, and uh, you know how it is in Miami. When there's a little bit of rain, everybody's hiding, everybody's taking two times as much to get places, and then maybe halfway through, decided that they're not gonna get that place. So we're a little bit light on people today, understandably, but it's okay. We're gonna have a smaller discussion. Uh, the quality is what matters. For those of you that do not know me, I'm Eli Bracha, I'm the director of the School of Real Estate at FIU. Um, some of you here, I see graduate students from the Masters of Real Estate. If any of you is interested in taking our master's program, please come speak to me or to one of my associates and would love to give you more information about our program. Uh, but today, the, this is a part of the wartime uh, speaker series. We have a very interesting uh, lecture and then discussion on basically on the future of real estate with, the, with respect to blockchain technology and the like. So um, I'm not gonna be speaking, I'm just gonna be introducing our speakers for today. Uh, the first two that we're presenting are Teresa Grobecker, she's the founder and CEO of Concierzia, and uh, alongside her, um, the other key, uh, keynote speaker we have is Sheila Fedgeran, I hope I pronounced it correct, and she's the Chief Operating Office officer of Concertia, and they will be just talking about uh, the new rules that are taking place and the new environment, and then after that we're going to have a discussion. So thank you ladies, the stage is yours. Thank you, thank appreciate you, you being thank you. thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, thank you so much for coming today. Good morning, hello. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Teresa. I'm the CEO of Consortia. Uh, this is Sheila Fajeron. Sheila is our COO. By way of introduction, um, Sheila came to our company last year, and Sheila is a powerhouse in the real estate industry. Sheila helped build the largest independent real estate brokerage in the world, from 1,000 agents to over 87,000. She has 15,000 in her organization and did $50, $50 billion of business last year. Uh, Sheila is our adult supervision in consortia. Uh, we were um, <laughs> a bunch of children running around before Sheila came to us. Uh, so my name is Teresa, and I founded consortia uh, several years ago. It's my second blockchain company. The first one went after the entire derivatives market. Um, I started the first online real estate brokerage in San Francisco over a decade ago. Uh, I'm still a broker. I practice. I manage. I am a loan originator as well. Um, and then SEC FINRA licensed investment banker. So that's my background. Consortia is part of the National Association of Realtors portfolio of companies. NAR is the largest trade organization and largest lobbying force on Capitol Hill. So we are one of their 230 companies. Um, did I miss anything? I think it's important sometimes for people to understand that real estate is the largest asset class in the world. American real estate is number one out of all of that. So the power that we have through NAR and their bilateral agreements with 90 countries is very powerful for us as a country and for us as an industry. Yes, and so today the topic of conversation is going to be around the changes, the current events that are happening in our world because what we do is largely impact and everyone in this room, um, I think, well, hopefully we'll appreciate that. Uh, consortia is not a crypto. We follow all SEC rules, the Howey test, we'll go more into that. Uh, we follow good funds laws in all 50 states and we are RESPA compliant. So we also work with the Federal Reserve. Some of you might've heard of that. Um, so I think that's the background of consortia. And Teresa had filed for the patent in 2018 for everything related to blockchain real estate or NFTs as well. And some of that has brought us to the position that we're in today. And I think that's important to understand as well. So as Teresa mentioned, we are not crypto. And we will be talking about crypto on the panel as well as a little bit throughout our talk today. And the reason why we had to build a private permissions-based blockchain is because of our work with the government. We couldn't take the chance because the SEC, as you'll see from some of our slides, the SEC has made it very clear that they are going to regulate the crypto space. And so at the current moment, all of the cr cr 
laws that they're going to enforce have not come out. So that's why we made the decision to build a private blockchain versus a public or a crypto-based blockchain. We also believe heavily in uh, consumer protection, being licensed in all the ways that Sheila and I are. It's really important that what is private stay private and what's allowed to be public stay public. Um, so this ruling, this slide that's up, this came out a week before we had to present to the Federal Government Technology Committee. So this one is a district court in New Hampshire upheld the SEC ruling that this particular um, crypto called library was actually or is a security. So this came out just in time uh, for us to take to the Federal Government Committee. And then last year as well, because of our lobbyists in Capitol Hill, we were put on to a bipartisan White House call where we heard exactly how there would be the unwinding of the crypto markets. And a large part of this is in preparation for the new digital dollar that's coming. So the clause that catches everything, as we probably remember from a decade ago, is something called systematic risk. And that allows the federal government to take control or regulate anything that's out there. So that is what we are seeing unravel today. Mm -hmm. That's what you're hearing in the news. Just listen for the words when they're speaking or when you see an article for systemic risk and you're like, oh, I heard about that. Okay, so some of the other things that I think are important is what is going on in the crypto industry with some of the banks going under as well as what's happening in the economy. So we wanna show you some articles in regards to this. But the government did do a pilot last year in regards to the Fed coin. I know we're gonna be talking about that more on the panel, but they were preparing for it last year and that was part of what Teresa and I were involved in. And Teresa tells the story that when she created or decided to file for the patent, predominantly she did it to protect against what was happening in China and Russia. And so China has released their digital currency. They are ahead of us currently. And we're seeing that with many things that are happening. If you haven't heard of something called BRICS, you're going to want to do more research because Brazil, Russia, China, South, uh, uh, South Africa, and also we have um, the Saudis that are talking about potentially joining them. And I love this slide. I'm going to let Teresa explain kind of the financials of why this is important to you and why we need to pay attention to what's happening globally. Sheila always says that I'm good at numbers, and I hate numbers. It's like this. <laughs> She's a banker. Ah, I hate numbers. <laughs> You're good at numbers. So we spend a lot of time doing this research for you guys and gals. So this goes over the United States and the usage of our currency. Um, it goes over the GDP of the United States. And when you add up the BRICS, they are slightly the delta between the BRICS and the United States is about one, one trillion dollars, 1 1.4, what's a trillion or what's 400 million between or 400 billion between friends. So if we talk about Iran and Saudi Arabia joining the BRICS, then we have a delta of $2.6 trillion. So what this means is the Chinese yuan, which was already released last year, is pushed forward into the global international community for being the standard of how oil and commerce is traded. So that is what's happening right now, is that Saudi Arabia and China are in talks of no longer using the US dollar as the basis for trade. So that would then slice half of the use of our dollars throughout the world. The basis of our economy, our way of life, everything that we import is based on the US dollar and the dominance of the US dollar. I can't overemphasize this enough. So our way of life is predicated on a strong US dollar. And this slide speaks to those numbers. Yeah. Um, and Teresa mentioned oil. Uh, that's part of the uh, goal of BRICS is to pull together who is controlling the oil globally to pretty much go against America. And so it, when, you, when you hear things about what the government is doing with FedNow or FedCoin or CBDC or with the central banks, a lot of it has to do with what's going on globally that do you want to be saved as a country? Do you want to remain American? Or would you like to become Chinese? Because ultimately, when you look at the history of the world and empires conquering other empires, 
we're really at that inflection point right now as a country, as the Americas, of are we going to remain one of the world leaders? I mean, we talked about last night that the UK is still a leader even though they're not ahead of US. And I don't know about everybody else in this room, but I would prefer not to follow in the footsteps of those living in China and would love to consider and continue our American way of life, even if we are not the official global leader, I would still love to be able to continue our way of life. Um, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time reading that one. This is about the central bank digital oh, currencies. Yes. So you may have heard, there, there have been many articles throughout the last couple years, especially about the new CBDC coin or the new Fed coin, and they've called it the Hamilton. Uh, there have been lots of names that have come out about it. But again, one of the things that's happening is the US has pulled together other central banks around the world to make an agreement to work together because they're trying to head off what's happening with the BRICS. So it is happening. They have supposedly made a deal. It has been in the news. Um, and again, it's how do we protect our way of life and all of the countries that are not currently living under a situation like they are in China. And the G20 is involved in this, if you don't know, and G30 is involved in this. So minds much larger <laughs> than ours um, are involved in these kind of talks of how do we do this and how do we work together in the future. I can't read that one either. I know, let me help. It's too far away. Uh, combine central bank action to. Yes, thank you. So ultimately, the goal is of the central banks to pull together because what Teresa was mentioning is what the dollar is to oil. The whole goal is to keep the dollar stable. No one in here wants their dollar to become worth a half or a quarter of what it's currently worth today. We're already all feeling it through inflation. Well, how do we hedge that or how do we stay with the US dollar being stable is we remain a predominant currency globally in order to retain the stability of the dollar. We usually have confidence. I know, this is so far away. I'm like, like even right with my glasses, there. I can't read. <laughs> uh, Federal Reserve announces oh. July launch for the Fed now. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so let's go ahead and launch into that. Okay. So, go ahead. So the Fed now um, is currently in their stealth pilot. There is a list. Um, if we were talking about this maybe two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, when I got into the blockchain space, you'd be like, okay, crazy lady, please put on your foil helmet and go sit in the corner and don't <laughs> talk to anyone. So that's, I started studying this stuff years and years ago. There was an article 30 years to the day when ICOs blew up in 2018, and it was written in The Economist. Who knows who runs The Economist? Anybody know? The Rothschild family, who controls and invented all banking, the Rothschild family. So 30 years to the date, they said that there would be a digital currency and it would be global. So that's a coincidence because it's exactly how that rolled out. Uh, so we know that the banks are in this pilot right now, the stealth pilot. There's a list online of all the participating banks mostly the very large banks, a few financial institutions, and consortia. So the Fed now is a clearinghouse, and it's to replace the wire system and to replace ACH. So the way that it's being brought to market is to serve the underbanked. Um, and imagine this, everyone gets their social assistance uh, from this digital currency. We know that the first part of the pilot for Fed now is happening on the US dollar. And the first part of the pilot, um, the public beta, is happening between May, it's next month already, and July. And then the public beta for, they're gonna roll it out in waves, comes after July 30th, July 31st. So that's where the Fed is with this. Um, imagine people getting their social assistance on this new payment rail. And if you have people out there with money, they have to go spend their money, yeah? So they're gonna take the money to Target, they're gonna take it to Walmart, what does that do? It creates a flood up effect of everybody who has to accept this new payment rail and this new digital dollar. 
So it's also coming from the top down, from organized real estate, that's odd. So we're gonna see it from both ends, right? And then meet in the middle and make sure that everyone has their time to trade in their dollars, their cash, for example. Um, People ask us all the time, what happens to my cash? Well, we anticipate that you'll be able to convert your dollars. You'll be able to take that money in. There has to be some kind of a grace period. The other thing that we think about is, will it be a dollar for dollar exchange? Probably, I mean, it would make sense, right? Because people have debt instruments. We have mortgages, for example. I can't imagine our mortgages being decreased. I mean, that would be such a great gift, student loans. <laughs> I don't think that's gonna happen. So most likely a dollar for dollar exchange. What is fascinating is which country holds the most amount of our debt? China. Was that China? Yes, okay. So China will have to convert to our new currency or walk away from our debt. Either way, we call that winning in the United <laughs> States. So we will have somebody who tethers our new currency. So we're pretty excited about that. I think too, with uh, serving the underbanked is important to remember, there are a lot of people in other countries that do not have banks bank accounts. They can't have a bank account. They can't afford to have a bank account. So we see this through the work that we do with other countries is that this is going to actually allow people in, you know, third world countries to actually, they have phones. It's funny, they have phones, but they don't have bank accounts. It's going to allow them through their phone to be able to have access to banking, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. Yeah, so actually, I always forget this point, is that this company called Consortia and their tech team <laughs> has gone ahead and indexed global properties using a truly global identifier. So we started at first with the NAR uh, portfolio, well, I guess, sister organization called Rezo. So it's the Real Estate Standards Organization. They created a universal property identifier, but it only really works for the United States. And we thought, hmm, we really have to go global here because we get inquiries all the time from different countries. So what we're using is the Google Plus code. The cool thing about, I, I just get tingles about this, the Google Plus code goes by latitude and longitude and already has provided addresses for people throughout the world who didn't have an address. Why does that matter? Well, what Sheila mentioned is people don't have bank accounts. Mm -hmm. How do you have a bank account if you don't have a home address? And what's shocking to me is that this Google Plus code has even been used here in the United States you think of everyone just having an address. Well, some people here in this country don't have addresses. We were just in Mexico mm -hmm. um, two weeks ago, and we were driving through like shanty towns, and these people don't have addresses. So we're really excited about this and working with the federal government to bring banking services globally. Um, okay, so how it works and what we'll be doing. So we're looking for pilot partners right now for a few different things, anything that touches real estate. So one use case that the FedNow program puts on their website is for the EMD, earnest money deposits, and transaction settlement will be 24-7, 365. Uh, could we get a raise of hands? Who here in the, in the audience is in real estate in some form or another? Okay, who here has bought real estate or have clients who have? Who here has ever recorded their instrument with county title? Okay, mm. has anyone ever heard, oh, wait, what's this question? Did my wire hit yet? <laughs> Did we make it to record today? Oh no, it's Friday. Oh no, Sheila, what am I gonna do? We didn't record today. Oh no, the moving van is packed. My clients are sitting with their U-Haul truck around the corner and have no place to live this weekend. Oh no, they don't have to take Monday and Tuesday off. No, they're gonna have to wait to move into the following weekend. It's the worst story. It's why our clients never call us back when we don't get them into their house when they're supposed to. So with this system of the Fed now, we can close 24-7, 365, and once we start integrating this with the county recorder's office, offices, then we can also get humans into homes faster. So we're really excited about the do-good aspect of this. Okay, so a lot of times people are scared about blockchain. So for those of you who have not researched or heard about it, we wanna kinda make sure everybody comes to the same level of understanding is that this is just the next progression of the internet. We have built Web3, Web4, and Web5 into consortia. And we're scared sometimes we, when we have discussions about what Web6 is gonna be. But we have already built this, and this is what consortia is doing globally in order to bring the next evolution of the internet to fruition. So blockchain is really nothing more 
than a spreadsheet. Teresa jokes that this is going to be on her gravestone. So let's talk about this. <laughs> That's the first time ever I haven't said the line. So <laughs> no. Maybe something else will end up on my tombstone. <laughs> So blockchain is nothing more than a spreadsheet and it's just very detailed. It says the who, what, when, where, how, why of a transaction. So this is a sample snapshot uh, from our version four of blockchain actually. So we have unique identifiers. I think that we are really like in the crypto hub of the United States, if not the world. So everyone's seen some kind of blockchain ledger. So I won't bore you with any of these details. The way that we're instituting this with our partners is what we, our C, CIO, our chief information officer coined, is legal Napster. So we're indexing data. To put everything onto data on day one is super expensive. So what we're doing is we're indexing it. Who remembers Napster? Napster, I'm not the copyright police. <laughs> it's okay. I was sitting in my dorm room downloading Nelly, ride with me. <laughs> so this is a way to index the information in the files that you would like to ser uh, share on your server, your computer, and then if someone types in an address, say 123 Main Street, the files correlating on all the shared servers, this is kind of like fringe computing, will show up. So why does this matter? Capital markets create the liquidity in our real estate infrastructure. So you have the house, you have loan origination, primary markets, and then you have secondary markets. Secondary markets trades these. They suck these out and put money back into this system so that we can then go sell real estate. Okay, so capital markets, when they're trading these MSRs, so that's mortgage servicing rights, or mortgage-backed securities, they do these by billions of dollars. So they do this, stare and compare. Is this the property? Is this information? Is this correct? I don't know. <laughs> this takes hundreds of dollars, and this creates a lot of bulk and a lot of waste on the back end of the secondary markets. So what we're doing is creating the system to put all of this in one place and on blockchain so that when they want a record, they can go to the indexed property, pull that, and make that into a non-fungible token. You go for it. No, you do this. This is yours. Ultimately, we're building Carfax for homes. So if you think about an asset, wouldn't it be great if you're selling a property to a buyer and you could see everything about that property. And the seller's disclosure wouldn't be so scary anymore. You would know exactly what had happened with that property in the history of that property. Would anybody like that? You'd find that helpful? Right. So that's ultimately what we're building through the indexing that she was referring to, is that you'll be able to say, here's the title, here's the seller's disclosure, here are the repair amendments, here's the home inspection. And remember what we said in the beginning, we're a private permissions-based blockchain. So if you as an agent want to put data on the blockchain, but you don't want to make it available to capital markets or available for public view, you will have control to be able to click the button and say, I don't want this viewable, or I do want this viewable, and I do want this saleable. So you'll have that option, which will give you a lot more control. And for me, we can say the Z word in here, I guess. Uh, we all know that there are companies out there that have taken our data, correct? And they are now billion dollar companies off of you. So my opinion, and that what I say to Teresa, is I want to take back our data. I want to take back those dollars, and I want the agents to have the ability to then monetize the data through all of the sales that they have done. So the intended use case is a solution for Dodd-Frank. Dodd-Frank says that there has to be a ledger for every piece of property or asset that a bank or lending institution has. I see some nodding of the heads. I like that. Whenever I'm on Zoom calls, when someone nods, I'm like, oh, yes. <laughs> okay, so we're supposed to know everything that's happening inside of the house and about the asset, and this is what it looks like. Uh, so my uncle Thomas Fry is one of the top future speakers in the world, and he says that innovation happens along the fringes of society. The internet has its own sordid past, and then we use it, we bring it back, we bring it into the core of how we do enterprise business. So the way that Consortia uses blockchain is um, not as board eight monkey smoking a joint. I, when I sneak that in, I get happy. <laughs> So um, it's actually to create a non-fungible token, so a digital file about the house. 
and this is what it looks like. So here is a file about a house. We have the unique identifier, the token information, and then we're able to share this information on a permissions basis. So there are a lot of public companies already using blockchain because a lot of people think, well, are you guys the first ones that are using this or building something like this? <laughs> there are a lot of major corporations that have been involved in blockchain. They're either um, live with it or they're in the process and throes of building it in other industries. So we've taken this and we have taken what's a a standard practice in San Francisco. Um, we do all of the underwriting about a piece of property before we ever put it on the MLS. We've done this for decades. And the result is, before going live, we have a data room about the house. All the inspections from roof to the sewer lateral are done. And then when someone comes to view the house, write an offer, their offers have no contingencies and close in seven days. If you can't do this as a listing agent in San Francisco, please leave and never come back, collect your commission check from this property sale and leave. So what we have done is we have taken this process, we've put it onto blockchain and made it completely digital and we've compressed the price. If one thing that I, maybe this goes on my tombstone is <laughs> Teresa was cheap. So I have compressed all of our business partners, many of our business partners on this project are Blackstone portfolio companies that are pro-consumer and pro-home ownership. So the data has come in, and Levi and Travis are the number one YouTubers in the country. If you haven't checked out their work, this is a shameless plug for our team members, please do. <laughs> Levi and Travis living in Dallas. They sold $100 million of real estate in their first year of production, and they spent zero mm -hmm. on marketing. So they completely retooled YouTube and the algorithm. So Levi and Travis handle our marketing, and they were some of the first brokers and agents in the country to use this process. They are selling homes and going into contract in two, in two days. The industry average in their area is 90 days on the market. They're taking a 45-day period for loan underwriting and compressing it into 14 days or less. This is huge. Who here wants to sell more houses faster? Thank you if you're in the industry. Um, the cost of underwriting mortgages has ballooned. I don't know, is that the next slide? Do we have that in there? No, ah, we need so, to skip that one. So the cost of underwriting a mortgage as a mortgage loan originator has ballooned to over $12,000 per file. If you were to write a loan at the real interest rate that it costs to do a house sale, it would be over 8%. And as we know, this has just crushed the real estate market lately. So this is a way to reduce the costs to our consumers, reduce those rate lock periods, and the end of the day, create a more palatable monthly payment for our consumers. Also, um, who in here focuses on listings? Anybody? A few. So if you are a listing agent, this is enormous as far as your value to the consumer because you can go in and say to them, there are four times your transaction can fall through before closing. And what we've done is taken those four times and we're doing the work in advance for you to make sure that we're gonna have a smooth, quick closing for you and take away all the potential things that could make your transaction fall through. We literally have the entire process done in advance. The only thing that is outstanding currently that is in pilot right now with Fannie Mae is to actually appraise the asset in advance. And that's something that we had met with them a year ago about, and they have agreed, and they're actually in the midst of a pilot on this right now. Because why shouldn't we appraise the asset up front? You know where the house is located. That's not changing. You know the homes in the neighborhood. You know the comps in the area. And then basically, if we appraise it up front, then we can just do a refresh through the appraisal process once it goes under contract and we have the lender involved. So that's where we're working towards, just so you know, so that you as a practitioner can actually do a better job and offer more value to the consumer that you're working with. And uh, we'll go through as well what we're doing on the buyer side. So we have a pre-approval, right, for the buyer. We've done that for years. Now we're saying with the loan underwriting process that we know that this borrower and this asset can go through an expedited appraisal process. So about 48% of all mortgages this year will qualify for a total appraisal waiver 
a desktop or a hybrid appraisal, which is completely data driven. So we do all the homework about this up front so that when you make an offer for a house, you can say it's going to take three days, for example, to get through the appraisal process, which is huge. We're also doing all of the underwriting about the house up front, the title, the inspection, the appliance documentation, and there's a, a home warranty product for $20. It's crazy. So the process, if you're doing a listing, is to sign your listing agreement, order and do, this is why I brought my phone online, <laughs> is to scan the house. So Carlos has done this process. Yes, it's easy. It's mostly painless. I think the, the greatest pain point is the human interaction, isn't it? It is. Yeah, it is. The, the app itself is very seamless. So we can also scan every single appliance, including the furnace, the AC, the electrical panel, so that your consumer knows exactly the... I'm skipping ahead, the useful life of, the, of what's inside of the house. This works in the offer process, and it works if you're representing a buyer as well. So it's truly universal. We've even created the order form so that it works for anyone along their stage in this process. So the different companies that we work with, like Teresa mentioned, are either NAR portfolio companies or the Blackstone family of companies. And the whole goal is, there, the technology is available today to do things that you couldn't do in the past. Because when I first met Teresa and started working with her and she told me about San Francisco, I, I said, I was doing this. That's how I built my team in Dallas. I used to get the seller. I would pay for the appraisal. We would have the number. I would do a home inspection. We would fix everything up front that was above $500 or more. So I was doing this without all the technology, technology behind me back when I was running a team. And I said, this is amazing that we have all of this available to us on an app on your phone that we can now scan and make the whole process easier for everybody. She, Ms. Sheila, um, when you were doing this, you spent, what, $1,500 to $2,000 per file mm -hmm. per home listing? Exactly. And this now today costs under $300? Exactly. This is where I'm cheap. This is going on my tombstone. <laughs> Um, okay, so the expedited title commitment and curative. So this process has been used for years and years. Blackstone has serviced, of course, the major banks in the country, largest credit unions. So what we have is an expedited curative product so that when something, if something is found on title, we cure it before it goes onto blockchain. Thank you. Um, oh, there was a joke in the other slide. It said that my mortgage it was, was. At, my mortgage was at Silicon Valley Bank. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry, nerd joke. Okay, so this is the um, floor plan. This is desktop hybrid PDR compat compatible information that we gather from the smartphone technology. This is the virtual site inspection that documents everything that's happening in the house. My dishwasher recently broke. It was a tiny piece of glass that was wrong, but I was freaking out in my head about this because I didn't know if I should replace my dishwasher or if I should just fix it, right? And times are tough right now, so people wanna know, like, what should I do with my house? When do I buy something or fix what I have? So this is included, once you purchase your title token or your property token with Consortia, we make this available to you and to your clients. So Sheila um, said, okay, this is great if we find issues with the house, but let's not call people's babies ugly. So let's find them financing so that they can make up to $35,000 of repairs before putting their property online. So this is from NOC, and this is a sister NAR company. This is an example of the consortium site. So it's, we made it so simple because we know a lot of us are not technology people or come from a technology background. So we wanted to make it super simple. So you come into the site, you put in the address, you'll put in whether you're a homeowner or whether you're buying it as a company because many of us have bought properties as LLCs or you know through trusts or whatever. You put your picture of your property, your settlement disclosure or your closing disclosure, whatever you call it in Florida, and you then have a property NFT with the details. And then this is also within that where you wind up having all of the other information that can be added about the other pieces of data that you have. And this is one of the first services that also checks to make sure that Teresa owns 65 Work Circle. So we do the KYC. In the banking world, this is known as Know Your Customer. It usually goes part and parcel with anti-money laundering. So banks have been doing this for years and years. It's the law, especially with the Patriot Act from decades ago. 
So we have just now brought this to home ownership because we know that there are things like fraud and house stealing. Exactly. Um, so go for it. Okay. Another benefit that we have is we do a check for property taxes. So we see, does someone qualify to have a reduction in their property taxes? We feel like this is timely because people are watching their budgets these days. So another thing that we have, um, Consortia has several sister companies. So we either have sister companies through our own investments or through the NAR portfolio. This one is for fractional ownership. And we just wanted to touch on this because we know that this is coming up in the panel discussion, that this is something that we do. So we have an SEC attorney in the audience, so I'm super happy that we can talk about this more. We have fractional ownership that's properly SEC registered with investment opportunities down to $100 through our sister company. So where is web three, four, five, six, who knows? Where is all this going? So this is reclaiming personal information. The way that I think about this is in 10 years from now, my kids are gonna laugh at me and say, there's a time where you didn't own your own data. And they're gonna be like, were you an idiot? And no, we really liked Facebook, sorry. <laughs> So all of my information that I own, I'm going to be able to retain. So this can be my rental information, my mortgage application. Did you know your mortgage application when you go to LendingTree and you ask, I need a mortgage if you don't have a good mortgage broker? You're going to go to the web. Your information is sold for thousands of dollars. And who here has ever received a check in the mail? I haven't gotten that coupon money or that, that mailbox money ever. So your health records, your driving records, all of this is going to be in my own, your own personal PII wallet, and then shared with in the institutions who you give permission to share this information. And Carlos actually had introduced us to many people throughout the state of Florida at county and government level with DeSantos's office. And they had actually, this is what brought the idea up a year ago to say, okay, besides real estate, what else can we use our system to build blockchain for? And they were the ones that actually prompted us to move into the uh, vehicle records and to actually look into the medical records. So we have built for Florida, to be honest with you, because of Carlos's work here. And just knowing that this is coming, and so the way we've set our system up is to be able to bring your counties, bring your MLS, bring whoever it is that has data that needs to store it and needs the control to be able to share it with who they want to share it with, that's how we've built consortia. So there's some rules. In California, we have a law that says when a tenant does a tenant application to purchase or to rent a property, that they have to be able to reuse this rental application. We can think of no better way of using your information as an NFT. The White House is also pushing for this as well because the average there's a, there's a socioeconomic break between different levels of amount of money and savings. At this level, the average amount of savings is $400. And if one rental app costs $40 and people apply for places like in 10 places, this becomes a, an issue with housing and homelessness. So we're really excited to be working on this project as well. Um, and this is a project that the Federal Reserve is very interested in, and it's ownership and lease recordation, so that a tenant can come in and claim that this is their property, and then we can collect and distribute rent payments globally. Yes. And this is an example of Web5 self-sovereign customer information. So this is with one of our business partners, Form Free. They use alternatives to FICO scores. So some people don't understand credit, but they pay their bills on time and they might have a bank account. I have found with my, um, my clients that I've had to teach them a lot about credit and banking. And so this is something that's going to be offered to everyone on Consortia in the next few months. So last year, I hogtied Teresa to a chair <laughs> and said, we need to get everything that's in that beautiful brain of yours out for the public. <laughs> so I talked her into recording and creating a designation course. So we have six hours of training that is available on every single aspect of what we're talking about and so much more. Um, and Carlos has gone through the designation. And really, it's just to serve, the com to serve our community, because many of us have not even, it's like, how do I spell NFT, right? <laughs> it's like many, many Asians don't even know what blockchain is. So we created this course for educational purposes. We're constantly updating it. Teresa recorded the first AI course. 
ever, which I was really like blown away by. It's a robot teaching the whole course. It'll blow you away when you see it. That's at the end of the course. We also have other resources and we're always adding to it. So this is something that we've done. And if you wanna continue the conversation, especially if you're an MLS, or if you're government, or if you're running a brokerage, or if you wanna get involved with us, we would love to hear from you. Thank you so much. All right, well, thank you so much. That was very interesting, and I learned a lot for sure. So I guess after we get this information about consortia and the wonderful things they're doing, we have a discussion. And I'm not gonna be introducing the panelists, but I will introduce the moderator, uh, Lorenzo Perez. He is the CEO of i3 Technology and Premier International Properties, but more than that, he is a graduate of our program. He is a board of our uh, real estate council, and he is very, very, very much involved in a lot of the things that we do at FIU, including putting those uh, speaker series, our annual conference, and more. Lorenzo, please. Thank you. Thank you for those kind words, Ellie. Um, what I'm going to do is, well, first and foremost, good morning, everybody. There was a lot of information we just received, so I hope we're about to delve into the panel and kind of discuss this and break it down into a little bit more minutia. Um, so I'm going to welcome our panelists to come up and join us. If you can, just walk up to the stage. Um, and what I'll do is I'll be introducing everyone. We're going to have, again, Teresa. Um, you already met Teresa and Sheila. They're going to be joining us back up. We're going to have Matthew uh, Santala, Vice President of Technology from Driftwood Capital. Juan Alvarez, Chief Executive Office of Black House Real Estate. Matthew Cohen, which is Partner and Chair of Business and Transactions for, uh, don't, don't criticize me on this, but I'm going to try to pronounce it correctly. It's Zerbersky, Payne, Sean, and Lewinsk. Close enough. <laughs> well, thank you guys for coming up here. Um, so again, we just heard all this information about FedNow, FedCoin. Um, a lot of the blockchain uh, innovations. So what I want to know is, again, for real, uh, from the real estate perspective, how is Fed now going to really going to affect us and change everything now that we're going to be able to see transactions happening, as Sheila said, on a 24-7, and Therese also said that. You, you, have, you want me to answer? Can we just yeah, jump in? I want yes. OK, yes. so to be determined, right? Um, obviously, early days. Uh, what we talked about earlier, which was a fantastic overview, is a pilot program. So we're going to have to see how this develops, how it gets implemented. We got to see what Congress does. You know, this is the Fed sort of trying to get ahead of the curve here, and we're going to need some congressional authorization to really implement this thing on a on a production scale. Um, right now, a lot of this stuff is interbank, uh, which may or may not affect the real estate market. We'll we'll see. But I think in general, what you're going to find is that. This is going to be a huge improvement to the way money moves, right? These are, this is an exponential improvement in payment rails, and that's going to affect everything from bringing down transaction costs to eliminating uh, the cost of fraud, which is present in uh, every aspect of a real estate transaction, to increasing consumer confidence, uh, to helping banks better determine what it is they're lending on, who it is they're lending to, uh, and what the value proposition of that loan might be from a portfolio or balance sheet perspective. Uh, so I think that this will have a profound effect. Whether we feel that tomorrow, I don't know. Uh, but in the next several years, I think you cannot sleep on this for you guys in this industry. Uh, you've got to be on top of it. You've got to be knowledgeable about it because uh, there's going to be a, a, a sea change in the way that we interact and the way we do commerce, particularly in the real estate world. All right, thank you for that. Um, Quick question now on this, it goes kind of going back to you uh, on this. So KYC, legal, do you see that being affected by this? Um, again, it's a pilot program. We still have yet to see it come out. It's going to be launched you know, in July. Do you see any effects legally that's going to be coming that you can kind of foresee? Yeah, for, for certain, right? So right now, um, you know, you've got things like the Bank Secrecy Act, which implement these anti-money laundering regulations. They require certain intermediaries to know your customer. Um, no question, I think, that a 
widely implemented federal digital currency would have a, a big effect there. Number one, uh, I think money laundering would get a lot harder, right? Right now, people hear about money laundering in the context of crypto and blockchain, but sort of the uh, unsaid thing in the room is the, the blockchain is the worst place to launder money. It's an immutable record of every transaction throughout a, an asset's history, right? If I was gonna launder money, I would go open an account at HSBC and get a lot of cash into it, right? Like that's, the, that's really the way to do it. So I think that the, there are certainly privacy concerns that I personally have about the implementation of these pieces of technology, but it will come with an implementing set of regulations that will protect consumers, I'm sure, will protect uh, access to that data. But I think what you'll find is, if you ever tried to open a bank account on behalf of an LLC in South Florida, you know how difficult this is. My business partner is laughing at me because we've been through this so many times. We have 30 LLCs at the same bank and we still have to go in and get you know, fingerprinted and give a DNA sample, right? Just to, to get the account open. As these, techno these technological innovations come to the forefront, I think you will not have that problem. I think that the likelihood or the uh, ease with which money can be laundered will be lessened. I think the uh, likelihood of, of instances of fraud will be significantly reduced, and that will all be because a lot of the friction that we now address by manpower verifying uh, li driver's licenses with pictures and phone numbers and voice verification can be uh, essentially cut out of the mix through the use of this technology, which will, uh, by its, its very structure, the very data structure of the blockchain, allow this information to be known and conveyed uh, as part of the transaction process. Thank you for that. Now, again, the other thing that's, that's also coming out with that would be uh, the Fed coin, which is, again, the Federal Reserve launching their own stable coin. So um, what do you guys see as far as there's been talks about, you know, the issues with stable coins. Is it really stable? Um, you know, the Federal Reserve is launching uh, the Fed coin. So what do you think about that, Juan, as far as them coming out and, and having the, the U.S. government having their own coin? Thank you, Lorenzo. But I think, uh, you know, this whole concept of the, the Fed coin is pretty much a tokenization of the U.S. dollar. So in essence, what that is, uh, the meaning of tokenization of the U.S. dollar is they're pegging the value of the dollar to a digital asset that will be sitting on the blockchain and it will be easy to be transacted. And that means disintermediation, that means liquidity, that means uh, transparency. And it, it's, you know, the evolution of the whole concept of uh, holding uh, any type of asset. So that will also create a second opportunity for people to have access to uh, secondary markets and uh, uh, different platforms to trade, uh, not only the US dollar, but any type of asset. So, you know, uh, I feel like the government is making a great move by pushing through uh, what many people was trying to get as DeFi getting away from uh, the, the governments. It's actually going back to centralized finance, and it will, it will be a good balance for the overall economy and, you know, for the, the taking care of, you know, like the anti-money laundering, uh, the know your customer, and it will also mean that the government will know everything you're doing with your money, where you buy, uh, what you do, <laughs> and at some point, hopefully, we don't get uh, any sort of blockage with, uh, um, maybe you guys will we'll talk about that later, later on, but you know, like uh, expiration of the money. That would mean, like, you have to spend your money, and if you don't use it by a certain time, you know, it, it's gone. So it's, it's a new concept, I think it's, uh, it's, it's great, and I'm actually very happy to see this is happening, because I've been working on this space for the last three years, I'm being kind of like the leader in the industry with the first, uh, uh, tokenized asset in Miami last year, feeling like I'm, I'm the only one kind of like going through the bushes and like opening the way. And th the fact that this is happening is actually very, very good news for me and for everybody in the real estate industry and anyone who's looking to evolve and uh, implement new technology is just amazing. Thank you for that. Does anybody else have any comments based off of that as far as the confidence? Well, so, uh, pivoting a little bit over on that, going actually into tokenizing, um, which is the main um, topic here is the Fed coin obviously is, is helping us and, and promoting the federal government to kind of give confidence into the blockchain. With that being said, tokenizing real estate. Uh, can you share some points as far as your experiences tokenizing uh, real estate itself and how that's gone and transpired? 
Yes, thank you. So um, for the last three years of the, this journey, you know, I kind of like went through many processes, learning mainly uh, the legal aspects of tokenization, what it means to uh, get the SEC approval to convert a real asset into a digital asset that's later on transacted on the blockchain, um, getting all those approvals, the um, the ability to you know put that property out there on the crowdfunding, then start promoting uh, these uh, tokens or digital assets through different regulations. So I would say regulation is key. Understanding the difference between Reg S, Reg D, Reg CF, what what that means for you and your and your plan if you're planning to sell the, the shares of this property outside of the United States, within the United States, to a, an accredited investor, to a non-accredited investor, uh, what type of uh, coverage you need to have when it comes to working with attorneys, putting together the legal structure, putting together all, all, all the all that's needed to just push a property. My experience tokenizing asset uh, is, you know, I, I, I feel like I was very enthusiastic. There is a lot of hype, yet people, or like you say two years ago, like, who's this crazy guy? Uh, it, it happened to me that I was like calling people, calling people, calling people, people was like, no, that's fraud, no, no, that's shady, no, no. Then one year ago, oh, that's interesting, let's talk about it. Uh, nine months ago, okay, I, I know you're the blockchain guy, let's talk. And then ever since the last uh, nine months, six months ago, people is actually calling me, asking me for consultation, and you know, like now that I did my A-B test, uh, understanding what's needed to push uh, Reg CF, push uh, Reg S, push Reg D, and actually be successful converting money coming from South America in the way of a, a wire or, or, or accepting crypto as a way of payment, or just uh, uh, doing P2P transactions just to you know, get people into my, my platform, doing KYC, doing AML, passing all those filters, then five, 10 minutes later, people is able to own a piece of real estate in the United States that generates uh, a dividend payment that we pay through stable coins. Uh, uh, you know, like th this whole concept is, uh, is, is huge, is a great evolution for the industry, and uh, I think I, I lost uh, your question. Again. No, no, it's fine, uh, so again, <laughs> You, you kind of went on a tangent there, but again, you did give us the, the implementations of actually tokenizing. Yeah. And again, one of the benefits is, again, you were saying that you do pay out dividends through a stable coin. So again, you'll be able to do it now through the Fed coin, which will give more confidence. So again, this is going out to the panels, and again, the word regulations. Obviously, uh, there's been some taboos going on with the market with the FTX and everything else. Uh, again, my question to you is, with this advent of the Federal Reserve itself launching the Fed coin, and, and, and really, again, getting delving into to the market, to the space, do you feel that this is going to alleviate or create more regulation requirements by the government? I'll, I'll try to wade into this minefield here. So let's, I think let's set the stage for what the, what the landscape looks like. You've got what the Fed is doing here, which is really gonna affect, I think, the US dollar. It's first gonna affect interbank dollar transfers. Second will affect you and I using dollars. That really, in some ways, is other than the underlying technology, is separate and apart from what happens when we talk about, excuse me, real estate and the blockchain. Right? A lot of what goes on with respect to real estate in the blockchain is what we consider asset tokenization. That is taking some asset, usually a limited partnership interest or an LLC interest, making it look, turning it into a token, and putting that token on a blockchain so that we can avail ourselves of all the advantages that, for example, consortia would offer. Uh, smoothing out some of these transaction frictions, lowering costs, that sort of thing, right? So the set of regulations that apply to banks and how they deal with dollars is very different from how you and I would be regulated for dealing in a tokenized asset. And generally speaking, putting an asset on the blockchain does not change its regulatory status. Uh, in a limited partnership interest uh, for a real estate project or an LLC interest in a, in a real estate project is a security if it's on paper which is how it's done typically, right? Making it into a token does not remove that status and does not really change anything about it, other than it actually probably in some ways increases your disclosure requirements because there are some additional risks that the purchaser needs to be aware of, uh, or at least some additional information that the disclosure, the, the ultimate end buyer needs to be aware of. So 
In this context, what everyone needs to be aware of here is if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. It's probably a security. You should follow the law, okay? Anyone who comes to tell you that something that tr traditionally was a security because it's now wrapped in a token is not one, and therefore you don't need the protections that are afforded to you by law, uh, you should be very skeptical of that, okay? Um, when it comes to real estate tokenization, you got to just came up, right? Reg S, Reg D, Reg CF, Reg A. There's all these different regulations. They determine who you're permitted to sell something to, what are the circumstances of that sale, meaning can it be transferred? Does it have to stay in a particular jurisdiction for a period of time? Am I limited in the dollar amounts that I can raise or that I can sell? And then it also affects the manner in which I can market it in some ways. You'll find that sometimes you can only speak to what we call accredited investors, depending on what exemption you're using these uh, reg regulations. Sometimes you can only sell to people overseas, and they have to keep it overseas for six months to a year before it can come back to an American. So uh, what's going on with the Fed is not really going to change any of this. The securities laws in this context are extremely clear, right? Sometimes you'll hear in the news, we don't know if Bitcoin's a security or Ether is a security. That's totally separate and apart. We can get into that if you'd like, and it is a little bit murky. But this is all pretty clear. We know the rules. You need to find an attorney who knows what they're doing particularly if you're a broker and you're facilitating one of these deals, right, where you're trying to do a large commercial project and there's a syndication involved and, you know, you're worried about your commission because it's getting paid in some token, you should, number one, put that sponsor in touch with an attorney who knows what they're doing so you're not wrapped up in some mess. Two, you ought to seek your own advice uh, so that you don't have a, a problem down the line. And anyone who's involved, whether it is an investor or an issuer of those type of tokenized securities, ought to just be sure you're compliant with the law, you know, uh, we just talked about making distributions in the form of a stable coin, for example. We have some wacky rules state by state, some states that may make you a money transmitter, some states it does not. Uh, that has nothing to do with the securities laws, which you still need to comply with even if you are a money transmitter. So it gets very complicated. We can't go through all the rules here. Um, what the Fed is doing is not really going to affect that today or tomorrow, uh, and it would behoove everyone here to be attentive to these complications because the penalties for misstepping can be extremely severe. Can I just jump in and say, um, usually uh, we are the stick in the mud, <laughs> Sheila and I, and we were kind of worried about flying out here. We thought, oh no, we're going to be the only people on stage talking about laws. So I am so happy. I feel like I found my tribe up here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, when people say, like, well, we don't know if crypto is a security, I'm going to take this a step further because I'm not an attorney. So um, I only stayed at a holiday and no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so when people say, we don't know if this is a security, I'm like, no, no, there are 90 years of securities laws that tell us exactly what this is. Like, would you like to go read some of those laws? Because I have, I'm licensed. If it, if it passes the Howey test, it's a security. So um, I come from the technology side of this, and I think you touched on it earlier. This is a discussion about data and actually data governance. So real estate is just one end of that conversation. It's starting in big tech. You're seeing it now with individuals' data and individual data extends to the assets that individuals have as well. So will there be more regulation? Absolutely. Anywhere that people start to digitize and recordize that digital information of whatever it's associated with in order to then bring it into the economic sphere of the market, the government's going to step in and start to provide regulation to make sure that you're doing what you are legally supposed to do, either servicing or providing a technology to other people to make sure that you're protecting their data and then doing what's right. Well, if I can add a little bit more to that, uh, it's just a, like a big differentiation between crypto and security tokens. What the SEC is actually pushing here is securitization of assets, real estate being one of them. Uh, security tokens are not in any way crypto. They, they use the same technology, the same uh, means to, for uh, transportation of information from in, be, in between blocks, yet the security tokens cannot be understood or construed as, uh, as crypto, and that's a big thing when you talk about the Fed coin and the, and the Fed uh, <clears throat> program is they're actually pushing a secure way to transact digitally. The word tokenization and token has really given the securities market a tough time for its, uh, its path to adoption because they are not one and the same. While a security may use the functionalities and, and technologies behind the concept of a token, uh, a Chuck E. Cheese token and a quarter are both tokens, <laughs> but they mean very different things. 
So from the technology side, too, people think and continually see if you, you know, look back at the craze of blockchain technology and tokenization, and it was the Wild West, technology looked like it was going faster than regulation, when when we actually look at real value and assets, it's going to be the other way around. Technology is going to have to follow what regulation says it's allowed to do before people are going to move their value onto it. Thanks, Pat. A uh, quick question for the audience, <clears throat> which, again, Juan and, and Matthew brought up a good question. Who here knows what a token is, and who here knows what crypto is? And who here thinks they're both the same? Okay, so can, can we explain that and differentiate? Because what I also feel that, again, a lot of people don't understand in this field is they feel that blockchain, crypto, tokens, it's all the same. And again, the media does cover a lot of this, but it usually covers mostly about cryptos and what happens, those being traded. Um, and again, you did touch upon the tokenizations, which again, that's where I feel that you guys can elaborate is where the real estate market is really going towards more of a tokenization on a blockchain. So if you guys can kind of talk about the differentiations. I, I would say the real estate market is moving towards securitization on the blockchain, not necessarily just tokenization. I think there are gonna be tokenization functions, tools, and products in the marketplace that then the securities that are on those blockchains can interact with, you'll be able to move value from one area of the market to another market or another area of the market instantaneously, whereas you cannot do that today because of the analog functionalities of how long it takes to move value across borders and across systems and interoperability and integration is not there today. And so what we're doing is we're saying let's introduce standards to information and the organization of information to create trust through and through. Lorenzo, to jump in, I think it's, it's a technical definition. So when we say security token, the reason why we say the word security is we're securing this with an asset. So it's, it's here's a digital representation. We went from paper contracts to show ownership to PDFs. You guys remember this? It was like the most amazing thing that ever happened. Yes, us old salty people were like, yeah, that was a thing where you had papers and faxes, and then we went to PDFs. So think of it as a PDF that says that I own this piece of property. And we use the word security, but it's meant to say securitizing an asset. If I can jump in and kind of compliment, uh, I will say, it's very important to understand the concept of a smart contract. So in essence, you're converting a contract to a digital document that then resides on the internet on Web3 and is completely different to the piece of code that represents a Bitcoin, which is a very small, short code. This smart contract will, also, will actually have many components to it, meaning that you will have governance powers, you can have voting rights, you can have uh, ways to me, uh, explain and have people understand how dividends will be paid and so forth. So it's actually a very long piece of code that has all the information, including in the smart contract, which is the evolution to the piece of paper, the PDF, then DocuSign. I was just going to say DocuSign. And, and now the smart contract, uh, which is just amazing. Can I try to tie this together? So this is an interesting discussion, the way this developed, because Matthew just gave you a description of rails and the improvement of the rails upon which assets and technology will function, how intermediaries will talk to each other. Just information. Information. If we make the ease of business, if, if I am easier to do business with because you already speak exactly the same language that I do, we can remove the amount of time it takes to do business, and time is money. And then everyone on this side of me talked about an actual practical implementation of that. What is a, where does a token sit? How does a, how does a smart contract function? Let me try to tie this together to you for a, with a real world example. Raise your hand, if you will, if you own at least one share of stock in some company. Does everyone here have one share of stock? Roughly yes, roughly everybody. Did you know, for example, that that one share of stock is represented by a paper stock certificate somewhere? And that paper stock certificate is sitting in a vault owned by one company called Seed and Company, C-E-D-E. -E. That's almost beyond belief that in this day and age, there is one company that holds every stock certificate in the whole world in a vault somewhere. And then that stock certificate gets sort of transmogrified into what we call a jumbo certificate that's held by your broker, like Wells Fargo or Charles Schwab or whoever you bought that share of stock through, right? And so you don't actually have to hold that physical stock certificate typically. It's not in your vault. It's not on your computer. It's just there. But what this, this system is what we have to do because that's what the regulations require us to do. 
Regulations today in our 21st century world exist in terms of custody and control. We need to make sure a seed and company has custody and that you control it so that we can tell who's got authority to do what. And in order for us to engage in a transaction, you need to hire a lawyer like me to diligence all this stuff and, to, and pr produce a memo that says, or an opinion that says, you have what you say you have and you're permitted to sell it, right? And then once you are, I have to then go through the process of documenting the transfer and it gets stricken on the jumbo certificate and then seed and company is gonna take the actual stock certificate and take it out of your file and put it into somebody else's. That's where we get these transaction costs and this friction from. And so when Matthew is talking about rails upon which these things move and the ease with which people do business, and the folks on this side of me are talking about uh, the manner in which this will happen practically, understand that the net result should be, if this all works out, that you have a regulatory system that reflects the improvement in technology and ultimately results in a cost and time savings for the people who adopt it and utilize these systems. And, and Teresa made a great point earlier talking about how this is starting down at the consumer level and also up at the real estate level. And we're going to meet in the middle. And, and you know, people who want to start businesses, businesses are expensive, but you can have ideas and information to do so. And Matt, you brought up a great point. Like, it, it, a lawyer has to go through everything, and that's very expensive. Lawyers are very expensive. And I have a friend, Michael Hiles, from a company called 10XTS. They're focused on digital recordization of information. He likes to say, I'd love to automate lawyers out of existence because it will give people the opportunity to start their own businesses and, and take information or ideas and, and, and unlock that value and the liquidity that's in, in information as an asset itself. So um, if, if you can do that and decrease the frictions there, I think that there's a lot of value across any asset class. I think I'm going to talk on, on Matt's behalf. I think he's going to kind of rebut that and, and trying to get the whole getting rid of all the attorneys part out of the way. <laughs> the, I think that uh, this type of thing will eliminate a lot of lawyers, just not the good ones. So hopefully I'll be here yeah. for a while. Yeah. <laughs> so moving on that, it's kind of, again, going back to the real estate sector um, and tokenization. So where do you feel the best use of tokenization in the real estate sector goes, and then this kind of goes back to you, Matthew. Um, with your organization, what are you guys doing, if anything, on the block itself or in, in the tech, in that tech space? Yeah, so I think, uh, again, tokenization is a route that a lot of uh, organizations like mine will look at and then find their way into, okay, we're actually talking about securitization on a blockchain. So tokenization, though, looking at the technology and, and the functionalities that exist out there today, it was, well, how do we take the useful parts of this and apply it to our data and data governance and modernize ourselves to become leaders in that ease of doing business with us? So if, if it's easy to do business with us and it's very easy for us to do business with others, others are going to see that they're going to want to join you in making the market more transparent and the market, you know, with less friction. Um, it's very difficult to get on something like a public blockchain today and start launching assets and everything with jurisdictions and you, you now start playing the legal game of, again, the technology gets restricted by the, the regulations. So Deciding what to do with your assets is, that's a complicated and loaded question. We are, we are making those decisions and we're moving in, in multiple directions uh, because there, there's a lot of opportunity in a lot of different ways. But I think eventually the, the end goal is just to, to be a complete and modern capital provider to decrease that cost to capital ratio to improve uh, that time it takes to syndicate down to as close to zero as possible and to automate through smart contracts. If you have data that is um, you know, verified and vertically integrated end to end, you know where it comes from, you know, it's, it's on something like a blockchain where all a blockchain is, it's a database, it's another way to store data, but it's a way to mathematically prove that data and create trust through and through. Um, it takes time to develop trust with people in business, but if I can trust you the moment that I meet you, I can do business with anybody. To compliment Matthew, I feel like the, the use of uh, the concept of tokenization of real estate will apply for both residential and commercial real estate. Uh, my preference is commercial, obviously, because uh, I feel like in, in, my, in my use and my study case, I, I found that you know, there is 16 trillion worth of commercial real estate, ma mainly multifamily in the United States, and uh, we can tokenize Eight, eight billion, no, eight trillion. I'm sorry, eight trillion worth of real estate is kind of like the the potential market. Uh, I feel like it, you know, if we jump into tokenization of residential properties, many people will be talking about the NFT and the difference between the NFT and the security token. If we jump into commercial, there is more. Is, is, there is a wider range of action. I like multifamily. I feel like multifamily is the asset class that uh, gives more. Uh, room for operation, 
uh, given the size of the market and also, you know, the the incentive of people being able to not only invest their money, whether they're converting crypto or they're bringing money from another country and converting to U.S. dollars, uh, owning a piece of real estate or the whole property, but also the incentive of making money through the dividend that we pay based on the rental income, that's the cap rate for everyone out there that's starting and knows the concept of cap rate. It will be all based on, okay, I have this money here and I can invest in a, in a piece of property in the United States that, you know, I have certificate of ownership through the smart contract and then I also make six, seven, eight percent uh, on a yearly basis that's paid to me through stablecoin, it's on my e-wallet and it's all transparent. I feel like the, the biggest uh, user case is on uh, commercial real estate. A, a little bit of a Debbie Downer here? A little bit. Yeah, okay, just a little bit. So let me give you some practical complications here. Well, first, number one, we're entering into a macroeconomic environment where I think it's going to be very difficult and much less attractive to put debt on real estate properties, right? Um, interest rates are going up, credit markets are tightening, banks are becoming very uh, conservative in what they're doing. I think what you'll find is if you're going to introduce the complication of the equity part of the capital stack being dependent on a successful raise of money that is facilitated by blockchain technology, given the stigma that's going around right now, it can be very difficult to convince a lender that that's a good opportunity for them. So I'm seeing that it just in practice right now, that it, the, the banks are not the most cooperative when it comes to trying to facilitate real estate transactions through the use of this type of technology. That will change as, as people get more comfortable, but that's just a reality now. Second is you do have to encounter or, or at least confront some of the more difficult issues that come up. Things like priority of security interest, subordination, uh, you know, whether banks can actually m properly measure their debt covenants on your loan to determine that you're in compliance. Um, things like general partner uh, payments and fees that get paid and how those get subordinated uh, because they're on the blockchain and not in a, a, a lockbox account. You know, so there's like, there are practical realities of how all the lawyers paper up a real estate deal and practical realities of how we could do a deal with tokens and blockchain technology and someone's got to bridge the gap and, uh, and it's been very difficult. I have very much enjoyed the consortia uh, discussion because I think that an intermediary like that or someone who can sort of speak both of those languages is going to be very helpful to getting the market across that, uh, that chasm, but it is there and, and I think you will find that it takes a very talented operator, some good consultants and some really knowledgeable people on all sides of the ball here. Uh, in order to get a real estate project of size done with both equity in the form of some sort of tokenized raise, debt, whether it's tokenized or not, uh, and you know, just covering the, just the dirt issues, things like clean title, et cetera. So not to be, like I said, not to be too much of a Debbie Downer, just understand that this, some of this stuff is very pie in the sky, and we do have some actual boots on the ground challenges to confront that can make this very difficult. If I can jump in here, I want to touch on a few things and also answer your question about where the opportunity is. So the question, if I remember it correctly, was where's the opportunity in this space? Okay, so what we, we fail to realize is that blockchain is merely an iteration of things that already exist. Who here knows what a REIT is? Real estate, oh, thank you. Okay, good. So REITs exist. There are 285 public REITs in this country. If you want to own a piece of commercial real estate, go buy a REIT. Who cares about tokenizing real estate, quite honestly? And you can also access this if you want to buy a whole life insurance policy, because insurance companies own multifamily, they own industrial, or you could go buy a mutual fund that invests in REITs or directly into real estate portfolios. So why are we going to do all this extra work? Let's look at the resi side. So there have been studies done on some test sample cases of fractionalizing a piece of real estate. So they still had to, because most real estate is still moved through realtors, Right? So they had to go through a realtor, they had to hire an attorney, which meant it made no sense to tokenize or fractionalize a piece of real estate. So when you look at the resi side, there's like this big gaping question in my mind that goes, why? Right? Like, why do this? Okay, now that I've filled you with doom and gloom, here's a business opportunity that I'd like to present <laughs> to you. Okay, so who here is driven by an office complex that says for lease? You guys see one of those offices? Who here works from home more now than they have before? Who has that luxury? Okay, awesome. So you see the obvious issue that there is. Does anyone know who is holding all those loans? Regional banks. 
Have you guys seen this in the news lately? There's a bank. I helped with the M&A activity of FRB about 20 years ago. I was the youngest person in the room with training pants on, right? So anyway, like FRB is a little bit in the news. That's in my backyard. OK, we have all these regional banks. They own 80% of these loans. Does anybody know how many of these loans are coming due in the next 24 months? $188 billion, I think. I love you, but it's more. It's $3 trillion of these loans. How much was the subprime slime? $3 trillion. What's going to happen to these regional banks when all these notes come due? Sadly. All right, so what happens? Let's go back to this idea of central banking. Let's go to how do we take control of crypto? How do we take care of money supply? Remember our slide? Systemic risk. One clause captures all. So in my humble opinion, that's why we haven't seen the SEC come out with these big statements. We aren't seeing like this vote for this new Fed coin. It's not being proposed on Congress because we know there are looming issues that are out there called systemic risk. So here's my, here's my business idea. You go and you bring together a bunch of capital to repurpose these office buildings. No one's going back to the office like they ever did. That is like just not going to happen. So if you're out there in the investment world, I would say go gather your friends. What has to happen to these buildings? Well, one, we have to have power, right? They're not meant to fuel a house. The second issue is, I'm gonna do it, I'm sorry. Don't. <laughs> okay, it's, it's the gray matter. Can Thank I you. do that? Yes. Okay, yes. She's always like cringing on our Zoom call. She's like, please don't talk. Please stop talking. So it's the gray matter. So do we need the aluminum foil hat? Thank no. You. <laughs> so the gray matter. So these properties have to go through massive conversion, which qualifies them for ESG funds. There's five trillion of unallocated ESG funds. So business idea, guys. If you know of office buildings that might have notes coming due, go do a good thing for your country and go raise a fund and go tokenize these assets. That's your business idea of the day. I hope it was worth it to come. Thank you. <laughs> With that being said, um, so again, you already talked about Web 3, 4, 5 already that you've already kind of forecasted. Where do you guys see, again, the blockchain and tokenization in the next five to 10 years? So we're not looking at one or two, we're looking out into five and 10. What does the ecosystem look like? What does the environment look like once we've gotten past all these rabbit holes and all these things that we're, we're dealing with? I think Matt was talk, uh, talking about something that's really important, and it's the fact that banks didn't like the concept of tokenization. As a matter of fact, uh, at my office, and I work with uh, somebody here from the audience, is the analyst uh, lo looking for the properties. One of the main characteristics of the, the subject property for tokenization is it cannot have a loan. Because we know the bank, uh, due to the subordination clause, will not allow the tokenization. It will be a, a, a problem unless we try to do a raise against the equity, which is a little tricky. You know? So as, as this concept unfolds and the, the government is pushing through the technology and is allowing, and, and also bank, the banking system gets involved, the concept of tokenization will, you know, will, will grow, and that will not only create an opportunity in the primary market of, of security tokens or tokenization, but the secondary market, which has grown exponentially. To, and I will kind of just mention a couple of you know, uh, data points. Three years ago, the size of the market was one billion. Two years ago was four billion. Last year, around this, this, this time of the year, it was 18 billion. So, you know, we're talking about tokenization not only of real estate, but, you know, securities, dev, stock, anything can be tokenized. And it's, it, it, it will be an opportunity for people to just own a piece of a car loan that's somewhere, or own a piece of stock that's, uh, or, or a REIT that's somewhere. Or, or real estate that's anywhere, and, and then the ability to transact on a secondary market, peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, you know, oh, you own a piece of this hotel in Coral Gables? Okay, how much do you own? One million dollars, okay, I'm gonna give you one million dollars in crypto, now I own that, that piece of real estate, and it happens with complete disintermediation 24-7, and, and that's, you know, that's the evolution. When we get there, We'll, we'll be talking about a new economy, a new way to transact, a new way not only to own real estate, but anything. 
if I, if I can just give a, an opening speech about the, 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 what's going to happen in the future is that's the way I see it, and I will let you continue. I would agree. I would say it's going to grow. Um, I think you're going to see more and more elements of gamification applied to financial markets, especially because those who participate, I mean, if anybody here plays video games, uh, especially if video games that have eco economies and markets, um, you know, these tools, the, the words we're using, tokenization, like they come from the technology elements of like being named after real life tokens as programmers figured out how to put information together. And like, and, and now that we're talking about tying that to governments and authorities and courts and regulations, um, I just think we're going to see something that we've becomes more familiar, um, but the biggest element of that is that it's going to improve access to capital. It's going to improve the uh, flow of information across uh, groups and communities where information may not have flowed between them in the past. I think the best way to look at how fi financial markets are going to evolve is to look at the way that communities of people evolve, especially those online. I want to add to something that you said earlier as well, is that if you can have trust between parties and all the information in one place, you can make better business decisions. So when we jump five to 10 years, it hurts my head to even go that far out because this is happening so quickly. Mm -hmm. I didn't think consortia would be where it was until like five years from, from last year. And it like within months, like everybody needed to know about blockchain. So if we go into the future, I see AI programmatically writing these contracts, I could say to my, I, my AI, um, hey Siri, can you please go buy me 5,000 shares of XYZ asset class and the, just go out and find it. I might have a friend who's building that for contracts right mm -hmm. now in the real estate space. And this person was like, Teresa, please code faster because my AI is gonna sit with your blockchain to go read the data so we can make these business decisions seamlessly. I think five years from now, you're going to see this start to happen. Ten years for sure. The contracts will be writing themselves. I think that, if I can add to that, because it's something else I think that she and I have been dealing with recently, is they, are, they already have something on the floor through our lobbyist that they're talking about from a securities perspective, bringing all of real estate onto the stock exchange. So this is already being talked about in the White House. And I, I think that a lot of times we, we have blinders on thinking that we are our own asset class and we're operating on our own and we're not going to be impacted by everything else going on. Instead of understanding, based on the securities part of it, if they fold real estate under security laws, which we have operated outside of up until <laughs> everything that's happening right now, and we become SEC regulated, then do you then have to have a security license like these two in order to even function in the real estate space? That's something that you need to be aware of that is a very strong potential coming down, especially if the White House pushes this through. And there are a few very large multi-trillion dollar companies pushing for this. Just so you know, we have seen it. So there are things that we haven't even gotten into only because from our lobbyists, we found out some things that are happening on the floor. But don't think that what he's sharing regarding the securities is something that you can take lightly because it is a very real possibility for us to even operate in the industry in the future that you're going to have to have a Series 7 or whatever it winds up being, license, or AI takes your part of your job. So there's just a lot of things to consider. So before you uh, continue, so yes, going back to, again, going down the, the Debbie Downer path, I always <laughs> recall the, um, the, Jamie, the Jamie Dimon um, always saying he was against it, this was fraud, and then you would see that in the news, and then three months later, announcement, JP Morgan, launching a billion dollars into blockchain technologies. Well, so, yeah, that Teresa was my has investment bank exactly. that invested in Securitize. <laughs> and Jamie Dimon was sitting out there saying, I hate blockchain and crypto. I'm like, OK. He took out our position. He bought it out for $50 million. And so exactly. So going back to that point, you always what you see in the media is one thing. But then you have other proponents. Again, a couple of weeks ago, Ken Griffith, again, went back to double downing on AI and blockchain. And he's going all in. So again, it's going back to the technologies where when you're in a certain space, they see the potential and they're doubling down. So, Can I share a funny story? Um, so, sorry, just let me share this. OK, so this little bank called Silicon Valley Bank, their CTO was our co-founder, like way back in the day, Milo. 
Um, we tried to get a bank account at Silicon Valley Bank back in the day, and they're like, no, you're crypto, you can't bank here. I'm looking back on it going, really guys, you changed your tune on that. I couldn't get a bank account. The only way I was able to get a bank account is because my investment bank banked with Chase. And we, it was, I had to, I got a banker to come to my office. I felt like the queen bee and they like did it at my office because of my investment bank. I was like, this is like the total, total opposite of Silicon Valley Bank. What was interesting in applying for that bank account, immediately the head of their treasury department called me and said, we would like to know how to settle real estate transactions in blockchain. And I was like, I'm just applying for a bank account. This is normal, right? Mm -hmm. It's not normal. <laughs> and meanwhile, Jamie Dimon is in the news saying we hate blockchain. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to sort of wax philosophical about some, I think, overall atmospherics here. As you encounter this stuff on the day-to-day, -day, I'm certain, you know, none of us here are experts on blockchain and AI and real estate, right? We're all sort of dabbling on, on, on different things. You've got to understand, I think generally speaking, blockchain is a technology of decentralization, of disintermediation, and of self-sovereignty, right? It gives you access to things that you should or ought to control or should and ought, ought to own. Things like your data, information about your house, um, your investment portfolio, things like that. AI and, and some of the new regulations that come to the fore, for example, trying to uh, pigeonhole real estate transactions under the securities regime are very centralizing, centrali centralizing because they are impo imposing gatekeepers. You've got to become licensed. You've got to pass a test. You need certain qualifications. AI tends to consolidate power behind individuals. Is it going to replace jobs? Sure. But it's also going to make people who are good at their jobs way better, right? Because it's, it's, a, it's a force multiplier. So, in the future, in the next five to ten years, we are, what we are going to see is a very big tug of war between the desire to decentralize and create things that are self-sovereign, which generally speaking, I believe, will help the individual, mm -hmm. and the desire to centralize, which I believe will in some ways hurt the individual, but it will certainly benefit government and certainly benefit incumbents, right? So banks like JP Morgan um, or Chase uh, Jamie Dimon probably loves AI because he can cut half his investment banking analyst force and get the same amount of profits in the door and you know the, the top line expense is now gone, right? He probably does not like something like Bitcoin because he can no longer get management fees for managing a, an ETF that buys gold, right? So there's going to be this push and pull and the opportunity for entrepreneurs and successful business-minded people in the future is going to figure out where these two things intersect, where the pain points are. Some of that's going to be cured by regulation, much of it won't, and you're going to have to figure out how to, how to act in that environment. And so I think real estate may well be ground zero for this because it is traditionally an area that is not super heavily regulated. Some of the activities like syndication and uh, asset tokenization are, but you know, sales of dirt real estate typically are not. And, and you will find that things like AI uh, are going to just multiply the ability for the average person to interact with this stuff. And so I uh, would say it's incumbent on all of you guys to figure out how this is all going to pan out, figure out which side of that uh, push and pull and tug of war you think you can add the most value on, and then figure out where the opportunity is in that, uh, in that spectrum. Quick question for all of you. What is the biggest issue you see for adoption for people? Where do you see that? Why aren't people, more people adopting and utilizing the blockchain and tokenization and everything we've been talking about, what is that challenge? Or, or what's the cause that they're not doing this? I think people are scared of it. Um, and I think that people are scared of what they don't understand. And that is the gap here. We try to do this with technology again and again. Um, remember, technology does not mean a computer. It is a fancy word for tool. So we've had technology uh, evolutions throughout human history that have made leaps and bounds in humankind. And I think this is another one. This is just focused around communication. And the tools that we're looking at now is we're saying, how are we going to structure and come together and decide on a consensus for standards of information and creating trust and doing business, and then applying other tools like AI to automate those things to give us our time back. So I think once people start to understand and they're able to trust the, the moving pieces of this entire uh, system, they will, they will be more keen to start moving on to that system. And I think you're just seeing a guiding force to your point of you know, food and shelter. If we force those onto the system first, everything else comes after that. Because once your needs are taken care of and if your needs are associated with 
the baseline system, other things will come to join. I think also we've got to be careful about saying why it, that it's not being adopted, because I would, I would posit that uh, Bitcoin is an invention, you know, largely from 2009, maybe, uh, maybe a, a little bit later than that, that is now about as mainstream as the internet. You know, uh, Teresa put up a picture of a bored ape on her presentation, and most people, I saw them smirking or nodding, most people know what a bored ape is, okay? Ask an auction house, an art auction house, if NFTs are not being adopted. That was a major driver of revenue and marketing for them this year. So uh, I think, yes, is there, is there a concern about um, putting your retirement fund on the blockchain? Rightly so. And it's going to take some time for that to catch up. But I think that if you talk to uh, many people at all, uh, all ages, all types of career paths, uh, all levels of education, they have had some touch point with blockchain, just like they've had some touch point with the internet. Maybe it was buying a silly NFT. Maybe it was playing some, to your gamification point, it was playing some game that rewarded you with a token that sort of got you interested in, in trying to make money for you know, playing with your thumbs and being entertained. Uh, or maybe it was me as an attorney who was like, man, I better, I better figure this out before I'm out of a job because I cannot advise clients on weird issues that crop up when they try to uh, put a, a token out there or tokenize an asset. So I, I, I caution people about thinking that it's not been adopted. I think certainly there are areas where it will be slower. But I think that this will, this technology will permeate all areas of existence sooner than later, and it has in many respects. In my experience, uh, selling security tokens within the United States and outside, uh, you know, massive education, like, like, you know, I have to create a YouTube channel where I have content in both English and Spanish, where people, you know, the goal is to kind of have people who's interested in the concept spend five to 10 minutes watching the videos and then, oh, I get it. And I'm gonna jump on the platform and try to transact. Uh, trust, uh, people is not willing to spend $1,000 on something they don't understand, they don't, they don't trust. So, you know, in my A-B testing, I had to kind of lower the barrier of entry to, from 1,000 to 100. And then people is, okay, 100, I can, I can I can easily, even if it's people from abroad or within the United States, they feel comfortable trying $100. They will pay with a credit card, they will pay with crypto, they will try and convert you know, any coin, shit coin, anything they have. You know, this didn't work, I will put it there, you know, and, and see what happens. Oh, now, now I get the contract, I sign the, this contract here, and now I see in my e-wallet that I have uh, the equivalent of uh, 0 0.5 of a property in Miami. Okay, good. Will they pay me the dividend? Let's wait three months and see what happens, you know? So it, it takes time, so definitely for me that I was kind of like doing this by myself and spending a lot of money and time and, you know, and effort with, with my team trying to push this through. Uh, definitely what's happening right now, the fact that the government, again, I, I'm keen speaking about the government pushing through because you know, the education is going to be massive, you know. The Fed or the SEC will not push through the coin without having a lot of education, a lot of uh, information through apps, YouTube channel, the TV, in the news, everywhere. So everyone will download the app and understand the concept of, you know, oh, I'm, I'm going to get uh, funding from the government next time there is a, and I will get it on my e-wallet. People are gonna run and download the app. Oh, I don't have a smartphone, go get one. Because if you don't have a smartphone, you will not get you, don't, you will not get the app. You will not get your money. You know, so so you know it, it's evolving. You know, and uh, the, the, what's happening is huge, and it's the only opportunity for all of us who have already an advantage and edge. But for people who doesn't know anything about it, it's very easy to to jump in. Very easy to to be part of it and to actually make try to get in business. Like you said, there is a lot of opportunity out there. And, uh, it's, it's waiting for us to tackle. I think the, the, if the marketing machine does its job, uh, and I mean that generally, uh, adoption will, will come to a pace that, that kind of settles within itself because what is important to each individual person is different. So you have to figure out how to make that sale to different groups of people. Right now, there are a thousand pages explaining each one of these parts of why you should care about block, blockchain, crypto, et cetera, et cetera. We need to take that down to 100, take it down to 10, and take it down to one for each individual person on the globe. And that's gonna be different for each person to say, oh, this is why I should care about that thing. Once, once we do that, then adoption will, will 
kind of scale up. So with that being said, um, and actually you're leading to the next uh, point is, and we're gonna end it with this question that we're gonna open up for Q&A is, for audience members, where, how can they learn more about this technology? Where can they, again, from your point of view, where can they look and find this? Again, breaking it down from 100 sources to five, 10, something that's paddleable that they can kind of understand this and, and delve more into it. My personal trick is, because um, I grew up with the internet and technology and computers, and that was always like, how do I find information? And still, even with Google, I'm sure you're all aware, it's not always very quick to find information. I figured out that I know all the information in the world if I know who has it. So I just think about the type or who, who would have this information. What kind of person is going to represent or done some of that cutting down for me already? And there's people in every industry on all kinds of social media platforms and all kinds of professional platforms, academic platforms. And once you go and you find the information that those people are publishing on a consistent basis, um, they synthesize. And then you can use tools like AI to synthesize for, further if you need to. I'm sorry to say this with uh, FIU administrators in the room, but I've always found that being adept at extracting information out of YouTube and Reddit and Google is far more valuable than a college degree in some <laughs> respects. Um, and, and that's me, I'm joking, but the internet is a wealth of knowledge, folks, and, and the blockchain and crypto is an internet first technology. And so I think uh, if you're motivated to learn about it and if you are uh, diligent in doing your own research, uh, there's no certification that you need and there's no class you need to take. Uh, the information is at your fingertips and if you want to be competitive in this world or in this market or in this vertical, uh, you could do it in 30 days with enough research and, uh, and meeting the right people. So I you know, make that your challenge if this is something that interests you. I have fought podcasts for, I don't know, a decade. And finally, in the last few months, I just have podcasts going constantly when um, either I'm working or doing chores around the house. And I feel like that's super helpful. And it's all about um, knowing where to go to find your content to make sure it's validated. There's a lot of noise and junk that's out there, and I would say uh, you got to be careful your source, right? Has it been vetted, peer-reviewed? There are some great podcasts out there from some really smart people, and they interview and they pick the best of, and they bring it directly like into my brain through my ears, and I just love that. I would also say um, check out FedNow. Sign up for updates. That's available to anyone, not just people wearing the, the tinfoil hat. <laughs> you know, I obviously already mentioned we, we did a lot of, create a lot of content, so yeah, if anyone is curious to go to Blockhouse Real Estate Organization channel and see everything that we have, you know, starting from the m main and basic concept of blockchain and how, you know, this whole thing happens. You know, there is a lot of information out there. I feel like uh, it's, it's easier nowadays. I, I don't believe in 30 days, anyone will become an expert. I'm sorry. And I actually value the universities because you know there is a lot of content out there, but you know, the, the certification of the, of, the, of the content and actually being able to interact with uh, peers who are on, at the same level is actually the, the value of being at the university. And I say that because you know, I'm a, a university guy. But you know, uh, um, I think uh, anyone who's willing to Look into this. Uh, there is a lot of content uh, that's for free. Uh, Harvard University and many universities have free content that you can actually download and read. Many papers out there, and uh, it's, it's not it's not too difficult. It's, yeah, right. it's perfect. Thank you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open it up for questions. A lot of topics have been discussed here. So obviously we want to get some of your questions, any particulars you weren't clear on, or anything else you want to ask the panelists. So we do have some microphones on the side, and I think they're going to be walking around. So if you have a question, um, just please raise your hand and somebody will bring over a microphone for you. I know you have questions. There's no shine. Um, go ahead. Um, do we have a mic? So notwithstanding wanting to get rid of lawyers, um, I, I have a question for the lawyer, who, who is my, my uh, law partner and my business partner, but I'm going to torture him a little bit. We, we talked about the recent passage of uh, Florida Law HB 837. We talked about underwriting on the stage. One thing we didn't talk about underwriting was kind of insurance and liability and how that plays into 
the blockchain and underwriting properties and, and keeping tabs of properties and the data on properties. HB 837 now enacted um, a potential reduction in liability for multifamily property owners, which says if you follow A, B, C, D, and E, and you go to a lawyer and you get your, lawyer, your, your policies and procedures blessed by a lawyer and appropriate state uh, regulators, we're going to presume that anybody who gets hurt or shot or injured on your property or somebody steps in a hole on your property, it's not your fault. So unique laws like that, state by state, how does that play into underwriting of properties, the data that the blockchain keeps on properties, and insurance underwriting, et cetera? It's too early for my own business partner to be trying to stump me with one of these questions, but I'll do my best. So uh, this new law, okay, is part of a tort reform bill that passed in Florida. It's aimed at sort of reducing what we call lawfare or like warfare and law, meaning these sort of uh, pseudo meritorious claims against deep pockets, whether they be insurance companies, landlords, etc. The interesting thing about this law is that it, it, it basically says that if you operate certain types of real estate, some uh, multifamily, certain types of commercial things, if you do some very baseline uh, activities or impose certain baseline conditions, things like cameras, lighting, uh, uh, stipulations on how you're surveilling your, uh, your parking lots, what type of locks you're putting on the door, if you do these certain things, you can get a presumptive bar against being sued for these, which would have up until a couple of months ago been huge, potentially catastrophic judgments against landlords. And what's interesting about these requirements is that they don't track one for one, but they're very similar to, in the case of multifamily, for example, the types of things that you would need to do to pass a 40-year recertification in Miami. Uh, anyone here in the real estate world knows how difficult it can be to sell a piece of commercial real estate when that 40-year needs to be done or is still pending. So why does this matter for blockchain? Uh, number one, it, it is not necessarily tied to blockchain. This is, if you're in the real estate world, something you should know about because this can make, a, the, if you're a broker, the sale of a property uh, much more um, attractive, particularly to out-of-state buyers who are uh, in states where you don't have these types of protections. Uh, it obviously, if you're a listing agent, can make the listing that much more attractive. But from a blockchain perspective, think about what we heard from uh, our friends at cons Consortia who can actually track data about properties on a blockchain. Instead of your agent or your broker or your lawyer preparing the seller disclosure with what is missing from the 40 year or what work has been done on a property or whether uh, the requisite statutory required deadbolts have been installed, you can put that right on the blockchain. And you can avoid having to have someone due diligence that. I'm sure uh, that Matthew would tell you they have analysts who are there to diligence properties to determine if upon acquisition you're stepping into a hornet's nest of problems, right? It would be, uh, in many cases, advantageous to say, we don't need that analyst anymore. We can just look at the data on the blockchain to determine whether this cri these criteria are present and whether the presence of those criteria would act as some sort of bar to a potentially existential threat of liability. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a new law that's very interesting for real estate in general. And as this technology becomes more widely adopted, I think what you will find is that this becomes uh, a very interesting use case for tracking this information and, and smoothing out the friction that comes along with d diligencing whether these things are present and, and valuable. You know, it's so weird because NAR has invested in a lock company and a security <laughs> camera company and an insurance property documentation. It's just weird. It's just weird. That Funny how that happens. Yeah, it's weird. <laughs> I don't know. Yes. Hello. Okay. So my question is about the cohesiveness of moving FedNow and like with Blockhouse, with Driftwood, the, le the legality. How, how do you guys come together and work together with this FedNow and with the, so many different industries, like you just said that they're buying different companies to kind of house everything under one roof. How, how, like, how long do you think that's gonna take to implement and for us in Florida and Virginia and all these other states in the US to start using the program. Okay, so um, you know they're talking about uh, like a lot of technology here. I feel like is it's important to get on the first layer of technology, which is putting your business on Web3, and that doesn't mean that you need to have uh, like virtual reality type of office. I don't think that's needed, but definitely put your business on Web3 in the sense that they're talking about certificates that in essence are NFTs. And they're saying, 
also kind of like the, in order to, to ease transaction cost, uh, make the KYC AML also a, a, an, an NFT so that it's reusable. So all, all this information, all these certificates that they're talking about are residing on the blockchain in, in a way of a smart contract or something like a smart contract that's up there that's easy to download or upload. So if you're, if you're in business and you're not doing anything like that, get into it, because that, that will be the first step. Then uh, I will say, <laughs> if, you, if you really wanna get into like the metaverse or you know, the virtual office type of, type of uh, marketing, that which is kind of like the, the last layer of marketing in my opinion, you know, marketing will play, will play a big role if you wanna put yourself out there as, a, as an expert, uh, Blockchain realtor, blockchain brokerage, blockchain uh, transacting, security tokens, uh, fractional ownership, and so forth. Uh, I would say, you know, hire somebody like like Matthew, who will give you a consultation and you know get these pieces put together. Definitely have an attorney who's giving you advice on how to, you know, the DLP, the LLC, your corporation, how you're going to do the tokenization of each property, uh, depending on the, your goal, if you're, if you're trying to, you know, uh, sell tokens for $100 or 1,000, there's a different market, you know, so understanding of uh, all, all the aspects I feel is, is important. And li like I said, I feel like, like something I haven't spoken about, which is kind of like the biggest, uh, challenge that I faced in my venture is, is how to sell these tokens. So let's say you're successful in a year from today, you have you know, the means and you have your platform put together, you have a broker dealer who's uh, you know, operating for you and gives you like a white envelope type of a solution so you can start tokenizing real estate. That means nothing the moment you're there if you don't know how to sell the tokens. So, for example, in my opinion, uh, the biggest challenge I faced over the last year was how to, how to find those guys that are willing to convert $1 million worth of Bitcoin into a security token. So, yes, I hired like a, different companies and they were like, oh, we know how to find those wells. So we're gonna open a Twitter account, and we're gonna do this, and we're gonna do so many things, Reddit, uh, and so forth. At the end of three months, no well. So you know, so the, the biggest challenge is how to actually push these tokens through. Yes, the technology is a big component. The, the, the fact that the government is pushing is, is talking about implementation, massive implementation, which is going to help. But then it, we will face the same challenges that we face in today's world when, when we become real estate agents or attorneys is how do we get clients? How do we get the listing? How, how do I convince this guy who's like a mom and pop type of business who owns a multifamily in Hialeah, how do I explain this guy that blockchain is the future and he needs to trust me and allow me to convert his property that's free and clear into something on the blockchain? You know, like 80% like of the people are like, oh, no, 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 get away from here. Don't talk to me about that, that's fraud. No, you know, but then, Let's say you're able to convince the guy to give you the listing and you convert the property into a digital asset. How do you sell those tokens? How many people is going to buy your token? Why is your token better than something else? Or the REIT that uh, Teresa talked about or all these, all these vehicles. So I feel like that's, that, that's, those are the considerations that I'm sharing with you after three years of like hard work and you know, bumping into many black walls. I'm still standing in front of this last wall. Of, I don't know how to push the tokens. Even though I was successful selling tokens for $100 in South America and here in the United States, and I know how to do it, how do I sell $10 million in a month? How do I sell $20 million in three days? How do I push these tokens? That's kind of like the biggest uh, question, and it's all based on marketing. If I'm, I just wanna make sure I'm understanding your question correctly. You said the cohesiveness of like, the assets and business like a Driftwood Capital and how it gets to engaging with something like Fedcoin. So I think there's a, two pieces to that, and one is 
to engage with any other party, you have to be just as prepared as that party is to engage with you. So if FedCoin comes out and sets some standards and says, listen, if, you're going, if you want to be able to transact, exchange your asset or thing for Fed coins and, and, and use that system, you at least have to meet these standards, right? In the sense of like, if I speak Spanish, you need to speak Spanish or we're not gonna know what's going on and I can't trust you. Um, the other side of that, to your point of how do I sell 10 million or 20 million, these lower amounts and how do I do it quickly, that's the business of syndication on the other side. So you have groups like Driftwood Capital that have high quality assets like hospitality assets that are considered alter alternative assets and especially in a market like today, you have a lot of investors that are looking for asset, uh, alternative assets and access to those alternative assets. Um, it's a very slow and analog process to get access to those kinds of, of smaller markets today and be able to move your value from where it is right now to that market. So you'll see the intersection as we see the growing um, crowdfunding model that we're seeing successful in platforms uh, within real estate, specifically like CrowdStreet, YieldStreet, Cadre, you know, technology providers that are reaching a large scale audience of, of accredited investors and, and, and raising capital for smaller projects quickly so that they can play with the big boys but on the, on the syndication, on the sponsor GP side of things, in order for institutions to be able to play with, with smaller groups, once we get on those standards of, hey, I'm a smaller group and I am just as prepared to use a standard like FedCoin or use some other standard, any, any standard that comes to be, it now offers a cost benefit where, where a larger group sees no cost in, in associated to be working with me or a group of others like me, and so there's more value at that point. So now you don't have so much of a separation in smaller groups and larger groups of wealth. I wanna jump in as well to this question about how to be Fed coin, Fed now ready. Um, so one is that on the back end of this, like what was aforementioned, is that all the banks will be on this new payment rail over time, because this is the biggest change that's happened in the last 40, 70 years in our currency. So this is not a, maybe it's gonna happen to you. It's happening, like it's gonna, it, it's an inevitability. Um, the second part is we're currently scouting for FedNow pilot partners. So um, in the last few days, because we're getting ready for this meeting where we fly out to Boston to meet with the Fed. So we're bringing on fractionalization, commercial real estate, um, an NAR, uh, earnest money deposit company. Um, we're also asking for practitioners to raise their hand and say, yes, I wanna see if my client is gonna fit this box as the pilot rolls out. So our website, shameless plug, is reconsortia.com. I'm sure this will get distributed later. So if people join the community, then as we get more information from Boston, then we will share that. It's, it's not just Boston, it's like several of the Federal Reserve Banks that we're meeting with. Because um, there are 12, 12 or 13, 12. 12 throughout the country. So it's a good handful of those that are coming to the table to meet with us to say, how do we bring these into all these companies and to these practitioners? So like where the rubber hits the road, that's what we're seeing over the next three to six months. Any other questions? All right, with that being said, I want to thank the panelists for being up here. Thank you so much for thank sharing you. information. I want to thank you all. Yeah. Uh, have a good takeaway. And Ali can give some final words. Don't be shy. Are we released on our own recognizance here? Yes, you, want to yes, you are. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody, so much for I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. being with us. We're going to take some pictures, I guess. Um, again, rainy day. Fewer people attended, but I really think that people that made it here, uh, I think it was worth our time, for sure. We learned a lot about what is happening and what is going to happen because those changes are happening. Do you want me in the picture, too? Of course. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, moving forward, before I say goodbye, I just want to um, uh, announce or maybe remind uh, people in the crowd, we have our annual conference called REACT. Uh, started as 2021, then we have a 2022, and now we have a REACT 2023 that is going to take uh, place in October... Um, do you remember the exact date? October, November 
23rd. Okay, so it's going to take uh, place in November on November 3rd, <clears throat> and we're going to have uh, panels just like this, uh, but more of them, and we're going to have a <clears throat> conversation around them. We're going to have high-caliber speakers uh, that are going to be joining us. We will be releasing who they are, and we are actually putting those panels together as we speak, and I hope to see all of you and more uh, in that big conference. So uh, that, is, that is basically the biggest conference of the year, um, and um, I think it will be exciting and worthwhile being there. Thank you guys for joining us today, <clears throat> and I hope to see you all very soon in our other events.